This is an HRT tutorial from Precision Analytical, and we're going to talk about transdermal hormones. So this video is going to be a very brief introduction to this topic, and then uh, we would encourage you to watch the full length uh, educational video for more information. There's a recent study uh, that I was actually a part of uh, a while back, and looked at the issue of transdermal hormones, in particular progesterone, and what values look like when you give transdermal hormones. What does the serum look like? The whole blood, saliva, and blood spot. And then, of course, we have uh, the urine information on that as well. And so we just want to go over that carefully, uh, but very briefly here, and then again encourage you to watch for more information. The, the issue, as many of you are aware, is the increase in concentration with transdermal uh, progesterone and other hormones it depends on where you look. You're going to get small, sometimes no increase in serum or urine, whereas the salivary values are going very high. And this paper really highlights uh, and affirms our position of the difficulty of using any of the tests to monitor transdermal progesterone. So this, what the study showed is that as you take transdermal progesterone, the serum values do nothing. They do not go up significantly at all. Whereas the saliva and blood spot values are very, are both going up very, very high after application. So it leads to many questions, again, which we go into in greater detail, but do these two, as they, they seem to appear in general, to agree with each other in that, wow, the tissue value of hormone is really going up. If you correlate one to the other, you don't really get a good agreement, and that really leads to some of the issues with trying to use either saliva or blood spot testing to monitor hormone, is that you have to start with the most basic of questions, and that is, does the testing agree with itself? And what I mean by that is if you take the individuals in this test, or in this study, and you look at the replicate values where they collected multiple samples within the testing window that patients are asked to test within, which is typically 12 to 24 hours after testing, what you find is that the values bounce all over the place from one collection to another. So as you look at the, the people who collected in this study, you have 14 people who collected three times within the testing window. Two of those people were eliminated because of one of the other issues, contamination. And in this study, they wore gloves during application. They put the hormone far away from their fingertips and the, and the, the mouth where the saliva is coming from. It was on the inner thigh. And still 15% of the people's data was eliminated because of contamination. Once you eliminate those people, now you have to ask a very basic question. If we test repeatedly in the same manner, do you get a similar value? And you just don't. If you look at individual number one, and this is progesterone, so we can see we've got a nice high or wide range of 8 to 33 here in terms of what we're going to call quote-unquote normal. And you can see for patient number one, they have one, out of three collections, one low result, one normal result, and one high result. If you look at patient number two, you get a couple low results and a, no, a normal result of the 12 people that didn't uh, or weren't thought to have contaminated their samples of 12 people, six have both a low and a high result with just three collections. So that tells you that's not going to be a very good way to monitor therapy because obviously you need a robust, consistent, or at least reasonably consistent number. And with both blood spot and saliva, you've got very significant contamination issues. I, I would say much more for blood spot than saliva as people are putting hormones on with their hands. Uh, but the reproducibility issue is really quite um, excessive for both of those. So can testing help to monitor dosing with transdermal hormones and in particular transdermal progesterone? Our position would be that with transdermal creams, and we'll get into in the longer video the distinction between creams and alcoholic gels, saliva teaches us that some tissue get a lot more hormone than is reflected in urine or serum, and this is an issue for serum or urine. But because of other issues, the saliva and the blood spot doesn't work very well either in terms of actually telling what's going on systemically due to the increase in hormones from the cream. So again, if you look at the data, serum goes nowhere, blood spot and saliva are very erratic, but they do tell you that 
there is hormone in those uh, sort of tissue surrogates of saliva and blood spot. Now, here's the thing that we'll get into in the, the longer video that I think is going to start getting a lot of attention and a lot of traction is that when you look at data from testosterone, from androgel, you can see that with a normal dose, unlike with the progesterone cream, you know, the normal range for testosterone is is here and these are hypogonadal men so they start off at maybe 200 something like that and the values do go up whereas with progesterone the serum values do not and the distinction is that the alcoholic gel is used there is actually a study where they looked at alcoholic gels and progesterone and guess what they actually got the values to go up to about eight nanograms per milliliter with similar dosing the problem with this this study um, that's the heart of this data is that when they made the gel, they made it not an alcoholic gel, but a, a water-based gel, and that really is the distinction. So this study can actually be unintentionally quite confusing because it looks as if you're exploring the difference between gels and creams, but because the composition was not made correctly, uh, that wasn't able to come forth from the study, and I think upon further study where they actually do this correctly, you'll see that as has already been shown. With an alcoholic gel, it's much different. So with a transdermal cream, you're going to get basically a clinical underestimation from serum, a clinical underestimation from urine, and highly variable super physiological levels from saliva and also from blood spot. Um, and none of those really work all that well for monitoring transdermal progesterone cream. So what should we do? And that's where the full-length video will be helpful to you if you want to go in and we can really break this down. And there are solutions uh, to this issue, but we do need to be very, very careful when you're using transdermal creams, especially with the more lipophilic progesterone and testosterone, and trying to fine-tune the dosing using lab testing because there really are issues with doing that. So if you have uh, information on this that you'd like to share with us, maybe anecdotal information that you found from your own practice, it certainly is a, a very interesting topic and very critically important with the prevalent use of transdermal creams uh, and lab testing in terms of where we want to find uh, optimal treatment for our patients. So please do watch the longer video and let us know your thoughts uh, and we look forward to continuing this conversation.